Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Let's get this party started. Yes, you are all eyewitnesses to what just happened. You saw it. Adam, you saw it. You know it. Welcome to Myth Vision. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Yeah, I came across your channel maybe a month ago. It's not been very long. I saw a few of your videos. And the one thing I like about your content up front, for those who don't know, I need to give you a shameless plug here while I'm expressing this, is um, you're polite. You're very polite. You're bringing critical thinking, which I appreciate. This is the video that just recently came out, Quran's Undeniable Error. This is why. And you think you're going to go in and you're going to go, how stupid, how this, how that, you know, and typically you get that kind of criticism from people who might be disenfranchised or harmed or traumatized or hate, you know, their, their, their religion for whatever reason. But you actually carry yourself in a very uh, polite manner, though you are critical and you don't believe. And I'm trying to carry myself the same way. So you set a good example in terms of behavior. And I just want to offer my audience to go subscribe to you, to go show you comments of love and respect. If you're critical, be critical. I just ask, do you, treat people the way you want to be treated. You know, that's that's number one. But um, yeah, so what did you bring Thank today? You so you... I really appreciate the, the feedback. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my number one thing is, I mean, I can go read um, scholarly works that will probably say this, but it's not as confrontational. Um, they try to avoid that. They just point out simple things like in, in a lot of these critical scholars will say things like, yeah, dual Karnayan is Alexander the Great. Early Muslims all agreed across the board. It was till later. You had some try to throw Cyrus in the mix. Some try to do this. Some try to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they don't bat an eye, but they're not doing it with polemics. They're not trying to attack or antagonize. And so I get it. Uh, there's so much debate and usually it's between Muslims and Christians. That's usually how it goes. <laughs> True. <if you> <laughs> I, I get this assumption all the time. So whenever I make my videos about the Quran, automatically the criticism in the comments come as, oh, well, have you seen the, your Bible? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not really a believer anyway. <laughs> You're assuming that because I criticize the Quran that I'm Christian. Well, I'm not. That's interesting. Yeah. That that would be the automatic. I guess they're so used to Christians doing that. And they're not wrong, just to be very frank. Uh, they're yeah. not wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's the problem I'm finding uh, is that I can agree, especially with some people that are extreme out there, like uh, Daniel Hakikachu and people like that that are really trying to argue for asinine ideas that are just ridiculous. And so <laughs> I've seen Christian – I'm friends with many of the Christian apologists that are out there – I may not see eye to eye. Some I'm, I like more than others. You know, it is what it is. But uh, I noticed that uh, Michael Jones, you know, went, debated the guy. And I was totally on Michael Jones' side on this because it's right. obvious why. But at the same time, I think Michael Jones is wrong about Christianity. I think he is wrong on his world. You get where I'm going with this. So Absolutely, yeah. And, and that's it's, it's a fascinating thing that you see very smart people applying literature criticism when it comes to the Quran, but then they don't really do the same good criticism when it comes to their own faith and their own ideology in a way. It fascinates me. Um, but yeah, then the flip side of that, you get the whataboutism. Uh, the moment you start criticizing Islam or Christianity, then the the, the other party is like, oh, so what about your book? They're like, I, I don't follow any book. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you proved you, you made some good points, and I'm not interested in responding or I don't have an answer yet. Uh, but what about yours? And so that's usually the kind of responses I get back to is what do you believe then? And I'm yeah. like, well, I'm I'm actually a skeptic. I don't really have a belief system in terms of religion. I'm more of a naturalist. I tend to try and be as scientific. I don't know ultimately if you wanted to pin me down with an absolute answer of like, well, what is really all this? I don't know, but I tend to go with what makes the most sense to me. And that is a natural worldview. 
And, and that is what I would think is defendable because it's observable, testable, it's reliable. I don't go beyond that and postulate ideas without having good reasons, not like, I, I, and as you investigate, you know, you, you find more reason to doubt a lot of the things that are being said in a lot of these accounts. So I want to get into the content here of yeah. errors in the Quran, as you came today to discuss some of these. And maybe we freestyle and go from there to various topics that you found within the Quran that are erroneous. And what do you mean by an error? An error is something that looks like a, a clear mistake, whether that is a scientific mistake or a historical error. And before I label it as an error, I go and read and study excessively the apologetic response before so basically, you come across a claim in the Quran, mm -hmm. which doesn't match what we know today, whether it is scientific or historical. Now, the only reason to claim it is an error is when you can find the ancient people reading the Quran, understood it in a particular way, carried throughout the generations, it is understood that way continuously, but then all of a sudden you find today we found scientific evidence or historical evidence that this claim is wrong. And all of a sudden the argument changes. Ah, oh, the Quran didn't mean that. Right. Only then I would say, well, it's a clear error, but you're trying to twist the argument to make it not an error. I can give multiple examples on that. One, one good example is um, Mary, version Mary. The, as, as presented in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Quran talks about Mary, uh, he calls her daughter of Imran and sister of Aaron, Ukht Harun. So clearly, and, and in the Bible, we know that there is also Mary, sister of Moses and Aaron, and she was also daughter of uh, Imran in, in the Bible. The apologetic response that comes from Muslims usually, ah, but, but just because the Quran called her sister of Aaron, it's not a historical error. It didn't mean quite literally that she is the sister of Aaron. Uh, it's it's a, in Arabic, you can say, yeah, or I can, un I, I can say, uh, Derek is brother of Moses. It's, it's, it's a way to honor you. It doesn't mean that you're really a blood relative of Moses, which is fair enough. I can take that with a grain of salt, but you're ignoring half of the argument. It's not only that she is sister of Aaron, she is sister of Aaron and daughter of Imran. We're talking about an identity here, daughter of someone that's not to honor, sister of, okay, you're trying to say that it is just an honorary term, but when you put, put it coherently, it, it doesn't sound like, no, that that is clearly an error. So, so that's yeah, a, it, an example where the apologetic response does it doesn't do like it for if me. You were trying to say she was the daughter of someone and the sister of someone in Arabic. Is there any other way to say it more clearly that you are trying to say she's the daughter of someone and the sister of someone, other than the way it was already written? Exactly. Well, I would argue no, that there, there isn't, and and especially when you put that. There was actually a Mary, another Mary, who was literally sister of Aaron and daughter of Imran. So right. you're, you're clearly confusing two identities here, two Marys. You took one from a particular context, to context and made her to be mother of Jesus, which was completely... I was going to be funny for a second there and say, <laughs> what if... Her brother, because it doesn't mention her brother in the New Testament. What if her brother was named Aaron? And what if her dad's real name was? Because they don't mention who her real dad. You know what I mean? Like, how far <laughs> do you want to go to try exactly. and fix this issue? So the problem in this situation, the error in your in your estimation, and in I'm sure many other people's, is that the Quran conflates Mary, mother of Jesus, with Mary, the wife of Moses, or not wife of Moses, sister, sorry, sister, sister of Moses. Sister. Sorry. So gets these two Marys mixed up in a way. Yep. And, do you know and why they do that? 
Well, I, uh, you're talking about the apologetics or the I'm just author. curious to know what would have made them made that mistake. Was there some tradition floating around or did they just make a like an honest mistake through oral tradition or something like that? Like, I honestly think that at the time of the Quran being, being composed or being um, revealed, uh, if you want to use that term, mm -hmm. um, at that time, there were many, many sects of Christians and Jews and the in-between. Sects that you cannot really label neither Christian nor Jew. Um, so there were a lot, for instance, there were sects that believed that Jesus is the Son of God, but not God incarnate. Um, mm -hmm. Jesus was born as a mere human, but then he was raised to... Uh, elevated to a god status so you had many many sects and the overlap was confusing at the time so it doesn't surprise me that the author of the quran heard a bit of here and a bit of there and got the two confused together because mary mother of uh, jesus was a very revered character in in christian theology right also in jewish sects Mary, sister of Aaron and Moses, she was a very revered and, and very respected character in, in, uh, in Judaism. And she's one of the um, top seven prophetess in uh, rabbinic sources. So who, whoever authored the Quran got confused because you, you have two Marys that are very high figures, respected figures, and he didn't know who is who. So they got confused in the in that context. Hmm. If you read outside of the Quranic sources, if you read the Sunnah, which is the other um, Sunnah for whoever uh, doesn't know, it, it's the teachings and the life of the Prophet, which is the second most important thing in Islam after the Quran. Now, there there are very famous uh, a very famous story in the Sunnah that when the Quran was revealed, the Christian of Nagran, uh, a Christian sect that lived near uh, Prophet Muhammad, complained about this, uh, this error. They said, well, uh, how come you Muslims say that Mary, mother of Jesus, is, is Mary, sister of, of Aaron? And the guy who got that uh, complaint from the Christians of Nagran didn't know how to respond to it. So he went back to the Prophet and said, well, the Christians of Nagran saying so and so, um, and it's like uh, the, the response that was given at the time, of course, I'm not uh, telling the story as it is true, but this right, is right. what comes from Islamic uh, sources. Um, You're giving us the yeah, well, what happened though. Yeah, exactly. But the, the defense was, uh, well, that's because Mary, uh, sister of Aaron, it didn't mean really uh, by blood. It was just, um, uh, you know, a term of uh, revering or honoring her, completely ignoring the idea that she's also daughter of uh, Imran. So it's, there was no clear apologetic response that was given. And, and clearly Christians of Nagran state Christians, they never embraced Islam for a clear reason. It was a clear error. And it, I don't know how people today cannot see it and they try to, be, to, to give apologetic responses about mm -hmm. it. Because in my opinion, that is a clear error. <coughs> Interesting that you point you point this out. I I've been wanting to talk to acad like a specialist specifically on abrogation um, from a secular kind of critical standpoint mm -hmm. and not from an apologetic kind of scholar, but someone who might actually come and say, Hey, this is what it looks like coming from a historical, uh, you know, using historical methodology and, and research and whatnot. And I wondered why he wouldn't have just abrogated that or found a way. But then again, maybe the Christians already found it because I don't know much about the abrogation part of all of this. Well, but you abrogation can that. only happen with, with commands. Okay. But it cannot happen with um, facts. So basically, abrogation uh, works in the sense of God comes and tells you, uh, hey, Derek, you can drink alcohol. Okay. But then... Uh, 10 years later, he comes, oh, well, that has been abrogated, and now you should not drink alcohol. So it's a command that was allowed for a certain period of time, and now it is not, it's no longer allowed, or vice versa. But right. it cannot happen with facts. I cannot say that Derek is son of such and such, and then 10 years later, ah, 
Derek is now son of such and such different. Well, <laughs> does it work yeah, that way? I mean. yeah. yeah, I get what you mean. Um, that makes sense. Okay, so Mary. All right, Adam, we'll give you this one. You, you you got me one on Mary. Okay, I agree with you, but that's that's literally it. Okay, there's no other errors. Just just stop already, right? Is that it? Well, <laughs> so <laughs> Mary is a good example of a historical error. Now let's go to a scientific error, which okay. is the very famous, long debated. Uh, again, th this was in my last video, so you watched it. The Quran says that the sun sets in a uh, muddy pool of water. Now, apologetic responses are, oh, no, no, the Quran doesn't say that the sun sets in, an uh, in, a, in a pool of water. It says that Dhul Qarnain, whether he is Alexander the Great or not, that figure in the Quran, saw it as if it was setting in muddy water. Like it appeared. So it, it's not as a, it appeared to, yeah. Right. Now, <laughs> I explain it in details. I'm not sure how, how far you want me to go here. Um, Following you. All right. So one thing, linguistically, that is completely wrong. Because the, the, the word that was used, Dhul Qarnain found it to be setting in muddy pool. Wajadaha, that was the actual word that was used. It was used 40 times in the Quran, in the entire Quran. And the, the 40 times, well, for, <laughs> you want to consider it 40 times or 39 out of 40, it always meant something to be found really happening. You know, like it, It's not like appeared to be happening when it's not. It's either found or found out. So there is no way to twist it. In this particular verse, you can see that when they took the word wajadaha and translate it in the Quran, they twisted the meaning to make it appear to Dhul Qarnain as if it was sitting in muddy water. That was the first question, Mark, or alarm. Why this wajadaha, out of all 40 other wajadaha or wajada in the Quran, was uh, interpreted that way? But now, if you really want to dig deep, you cannot ignore that. Again, we can argue that Dhul Qarnain is Alexander the Great or not. But in Greek mythology, there was Helios, the sun god, who used to, um, as the Greek mythology said, that he used to pull the, the sun with his chariot uh, in the sky all the way to another god, Oceanus, or Ocanus, um, a body of water that was, in, in the Greek cosmology, the, of course, the earth was flat, and you have this ma massive body of water that circulates around the earth, so Helios would go all the way to the far west, go to Oceanus, take the sun through, through the river where it comes um, back from the east the, the next day. That's in the Greek mythology. So now you're telling me again that the Quran didn't borrow any of that mythology and the fact that the sun was actually setting in water right there. No, 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 no. And then you take on in consideration the Egyptian Ra, Again, the sun god who used to sail around the cosmology of the ancient Egyptians, again, in boats, in sailboats. They're literally known as the solar boats. Again, no, the, the, the sun has no relation setting in water. The Quran didn't mean that. It meant that. So it, it feels like the apologetic responses are very, very fragile uh, when, it, when it comes to counter the, the, the clear mm -hmm. claim and then again, you go to the Sunnah and you'll find that every single Muslim of the early times understood it, that the, the sun sets in um, a muddy pool. Um, in one story I presented in my video, they called for a, a Muslim guy who was from a Jewish background, Ka'b al-Ahbar. They called him and asked him, hey, well, Ka'b, have you heard what the Prophet said? Well, where, where does the, the sun set? Only because they were debating, does it set in a muddy pool or in a hot pool? The word in the Quran, hamia or hamia, it's it's a very close word. So instead of asking him about what Dul Qarnain saw, was it in a muddy pool or in a hot pool? They actually asked him a very interesting question. Hey, Kab, what does the Torah say about the the place of sunset? And then Kab responds, "Well, 
in, I, I don't know. Well, I, I will leave the Quran aside, but in the Torah, it says that the sun sets in uh, mud and water. Now, that is not about Dul Qarnain at all. We're talking about clear mythology here. We're talking about right. people who believe the sun to set in mud and water. Right. So to come today and say, well, no, actually, the Quran didn't mean that doesn't do it for me it, it clearly fell into an error again you want to deny it be my guest if i can just make one point that i think anyone who's been on a beach uh like more like the west coast and if you're in the u.s or if you've been on a, a large lake or a large body of water and you saw the sun setting from my perception it looks like the sun is going down into this you know wavy watery sunset into the water it's going down into the water from your perception like you mm -hmm. could understand why anyone would say that and it wouldn't have been a problem what ends up becoming a problem is the same thing in antiquity when the gods used to dwell on mountains yahweh dwelt on horeb or sinai you know mount olympus was on certain mountains and once explorers had already checked out those mountains and saw there's nothing up there the gods end up in the clouds. And then eventually we end up figuring out, wow, we're, we're going above the clouds. I don't see the gods. Well, you know, God's outside space and time. And, uh, you know, God becomes unfalsifiable. Uh, all of these things become unfalsifiable. They keep pushing it to the beyond uh, than what exactly. it was originally. And so I had no problem. I think it's kind of neat that they thought this way. In some respects, I thought, you know, you look at the sun, that looks natural, looks normal, that it would do that but um what happens when the scientific uh you know world starts to come and press on these old ideas saying hey that doesn't work um this is how things really work and you have a book saying no 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 and fundamentalists i'll say that aren't adapting to modern concepts see that's something i can respect about people who might be uh, people who hold to religion traditionally, but they're not so fundamentalist that the evidence doesn't lead them down a certain path. They, hey, that's my tradition. Yeah, it's it's an old book, uh, old ideas. That was the best they knew at the time. We know better now. That's that's a good thing. If people yes. are holding to, I need to keep this old idea true, slavery, for example, or the treatment of women or things like that, that's a problem. You see where I'm heading with this. So. Yes, 100%. Well, to, to take the, the old values and apply it to, to today as if these values are the highest and the ultimate values that we should live by, it, it, yeah, you really have to <clears throat> leave room to understand where it came from, why it was accepted and understood in that context back in its time, but to, to bring it to our here and now is very problematic. So yes. Mm. And just one note, I do think it, the dual Quran in its context was um, Alexander the Great. Tommaso Tessei, I think that's how you pronounce his name, wrote a lot on this, exploring historically finding where the tradition coming from Jews and Christians all the way down to uh, the Muslims in Arabia. But Beyond that, too, is the idea that I think there was a huge scientific revolution around the 8th, 9th century with Muslims actually pioneering probably the number one people for a period of time on planet Earth, pushing the, the, the science to a new level. They had come across all this ancient Greek material, the Greek philosophers. They were translating this stuff over from Greek into Arabic and stuff, and they were pioneering a lot of the advanced thinking. I'm not saying that the Quran itself had this, but I imagine the ideas were around, especially with the, you know, the various traditions. And if he was uh, trading, going out and trading, he must have learned something along the way. I just, I definitely think the mythology level needs to be brought in. That whole idea needs to be brought in. You start comparing it to the other religions and how they dealt with this stuff. It's very similar. So I don't know why that's a problem other than I have this needs to be true over against the Christians or over against the atheists or over against whoever. That's the only thing I could think of is why they're defending it this way. It's because, well, the Quran is, is a very unique document. So it, it's un unlike the, the, the Bible, whether from the perspective of 
Jewish traditions or, or the Christian theology, there is this understanding that the Bible was written by people. It was, yes, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, but at the end of the day, we understand that it was written by human beings. So it, from that, it is acceptable and understood that you can say, well, yeah, people were influenced by the mythology of their time. People understood it in that context. There is room for that in nearly every other religion, Jewish, Christian, or otherwise. But when it comes to the Quran, the uniqueness of it is that it was dictated word for word by God. God is the author. It's not like inspired by God. It is the actual literal words that came out of God's mouth to Gabriel, his angel, to Muhammad the prophet. Now, you cannot accept that the text has been influenced by mythology or, or any other worldly elements, because how could God be influenced by what's circulating at the time? So th right. th this is what makes the Quran a very special case to study. And when you study the textual criticism of the Quran, it is a, a different school of thought than when you study textual criticism for the Bible, uh, Jewish or Christian. It makes me wonder if the early Muslims saw the Quran that... I wonder if the development of absolute perfection directly from God out of heaven, like almost like I hear some Muslims seem to portray it as like, this is the perfect book that almost floated down like, ah, and it came down directly from God. Um, I wonder if the early Muslims actually thought that or if they had more of a nuanced understanding of the material saying, look, it's inspired by Allah um, and, and the message, the words, the oral words that were spoken to him through the, the angel Gabriel to uh, Muhammad, he puts that into the Quran or gave those words to us and we put them into a book we call the Quran. I'm wondering if they're a little bit more nuanced instead of like, absolute perfect directly out of heaven i don't know um i don't know have you seen it because if the claim is that they all from the beginning thought this way it does make it a special case because to me it makes it more falsifiable um mm -hmm. much more falsifiable than allowing human involvement and even potential human error in the text of the bible most christians you run across aren't fundamentalist unless you're in america but like you're gonna find them and they go yeah yeah there's contradictions yeah yeah yeah. there's it's you know humans wrote this but it was inspired there's this overarching message that god's trying to convey oh okay so when you find all these issues many christians don't lose their faith they're like uh, okay many like me though who believed it was inerrant infallible god really was trying to preserve it perfect as much as possible um and i found all this other stuff out really popped my bubble I could not <laughs> my faith. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, the, the, in the Quran, there is evidence for both. There is evidence that from as early as you can go, people considered the Quran to be the actual literal words re revealed from God's mouth. And there is also evidence that it is not. Well, it, it depends how you want to take it. Because you can see clearly that people did not transmit the Quran exactly word for word. So you would question, well, if, if, if this is the actual word that came from God, why didn't this word specifically carry on? And I'm talking about a literal word. This is when you find all the con concepts like um, abrogation, luh uh, al-mahfuz, literally the the book that is written in heaven so the claim is that there is a copy of the quran that is written and preserved in heaven and that is the perfect preservation of the quran it's i know it's circular reasoning but this is mentioned in the quran itself the quran tells us that there is a copy of itself up there mm -hmm. with god so now, it's a very complex issue, but all, all I can say now in this time that 
you can, you can provide evidence for both, whether you want to take it as it was from God early on, or it was a later development in history that people came to believe at the about 60, 70 uh, years after the death of the Prophet, that the Quran now is revealed from God, but they, they had some loose understanding around that. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I was wondering. I mean, I don't know because our sources are late in terms of talking about the life and even how the Quran, how we got the Quran. Uh, there's different voices explaining, but it seems that, you know, the collections of it on stones and, and, and leaves and things like that and getting warriors that are dying off to come and tell us what was said by the prophet and get all that written down, um, depending on what you're reading exactly how because there's different stories about that but um if, let's go into a few more examples of problems that you find that kind of reveal the man-made or the human aspect of this supposed divine th through and through divine book and then i'd like to ask you a personal question about your experience since you've been speaking out about this what how you've your treatment, how have you been treated? And I'd like to know on a personal level, those things. Okay. So the first question, there is another video on my channel where I talk about three questions that according to the Sunnah, um, according to Islamic traditions, the Jews came to ask Prophet Muhammad. They asked him about the soul and they don't, they didn't, don't really, um, clarify if they're asking about the human soul or the soul they ask you about the soul and what's the name and, of this video um muhammad was he really a prophet i think how old was this do you know uh it's about a year old now okay i'm finding um, it now so i could share it to people in the chat right I think it's 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 one of those videos that you um, gave me a, a shout out for on your channel about six seven months ago. Oh, um, I did. Yes, you did. You, you, but you put it on the YouTube community tab. Okay. Okay. Five uh, human errors in the Quran that revealed the author was not God. No, that's another one. <laughs> okay. You shouted out too. <laughs> I did. Okay. So I'm, okay. Okay. But um, yeah, you, you can be a prophet. Was it? Yeah, because uh, I think I, I changed the um, the title of the video after the shout out, but the link remains the same. I'm just sharing what? it. This is the one. I <laughs> <laughs> Please forgive me. Go ahead. <laughs> so apparently, according to Islam, uh, to uh, to Islamic traditions, the, the Jews came and asked Prophet Muhammad three questions: one about the soul, two about young men um, that lived in ancient past. How many were they, and what's their story? And the third thing um, was about Dukarni. So three questions. Now the way these three questions were, and and anyone debating this, it's actually in the Quran. So even if you're gonna say, well, I don't believe in uh, in, in traditions, I don't believe in Sunnah. It's Hadith Daif. It's it's a it's a refuted um, Hadith or refuted narrative. I I don't agree with. Well, it is actually in the Quran that these three things, uh, it says, Wayas alunaka, meaning they ask you about the Qarnain, they ask you about the spirit, and they ask. So you cannot refute that they came from questions from people around Prophet Muhammad at the time. Now, to the naked eye, it looks like these three questions were random questions. Unless you really look closely, you'll find that the three questions come from the book of Daniel in the Bible, which a brilliant tactic that the Jews did when they wanted to really examine Muhammad's claim for prophethood. The most interesting thing is the way these three questions were answered in the Quran. The first, the first question was, when they ask you about the spirit or about the soul, say, I don't know, it's something from God. I'm like, well, yeah, I know. Well, we're, we're, asking God, we're asking you to ask God and give us some answer. So, it wasn't really an answer in a way. What do you mean? I don't know. We're not asking you, you. We're asking you to ask God. So that was the first one. And then Dul Karnain, I, I guess we, we give him <laughs> enough exposure for now. <laughs> but the, the, the story of um, 
the young boys or the, the, the young men who lived in ancient past, we're, we're talking about Shadrach and Meshach and Abdnero. These are uh, the, the Hebrew names of the three uh, young men in the book of Daniel. They were put in fire and the fire didn't consume them. I'm not sure if you know the story in the book of Daniel. Oh, yeah. But then Prophet Muhammad had no clue what they're asking about. So he went and borrowed a, another myth um, called the young men of Ephesus which is a Christian legend. Of course, the Jews don't even be believe in Christian legends or Christian miracles. But because of the confusion, again, it's, it's the classic example. He confuses what's Jewish and what's Christian. Because at that time, there were many sects and you cannot really draw a line between what's Jewish and what's Christian. So this is the second time, other than Mary, sister of Aaron, daughter of Imran, he does it again confusing the seven sleepers of Ephesus, a Christian legend, with the three young men of the, in, in the book of Daniel and gives a completely off-the-mark answer. And of course, the, the Jews didn't agree or accept uh, or take these three answers um, anyway. Um, and even the answer when, when, when he... The, the question was clearly, how many are they and what is their story? And in the Quran, it says, some people say that they are six and their dog was the seventh. Some people say they were seven and their dog was the eighth. But God knows how many were they. That's the literal answer given in the Quran, in, in Surah Al-Kahf. In, in, in so again, what do you mean some people say such and some people say such and, and, and God knows? Well, we're asking you because we're trying to verify that you get your information from God and you're unable to provide any of the answers that shows that you are a prophet who talks to God. So that's that's another uh, one. <coughs> he, could have, he could have solved this by if he knew the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story, he yeah. could have probably given them a sufficient answer and they might have been convinced but it seems according to what you've been saying here that like if he threw them the sleepers of ephesus instead of the shadrach meshach and abednego context then they're like what's up with this you know i'm a big fan of seeing even these sources critically like some of these scholars wonder were there really satanic verses you know um uh -huh. some think maybe there's something like a memory that goes back and then others who say no and then some say it's a theological thing going like there's always like different schools of thought even in the critical scholarly world that aren't apologetic and they have different views but i don't know that one uh i'd love to look and see deeper but you kind of you kind of think about that what's another one uh What's another one? Let me let me just close this curtain because the, the sun keeps blinding me. So just give me <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> one second. All right. Thanks for those super chats, everybody. I will get to them. Um, bear with me here. I am just trying to get through a little bit of context in my first uh, interview discussing this with Adam, and then we will come to your super chats. So thanks for the support. Appreciate the love. Hit the like button. Share this out. All right, Adam. All right. What's another error? Um, or another issue that you see, something that, you know. Um, another issue I see is the acceptance of the Quran. Or so, so the Quran talks about Jesus as the Christ. And that, in my opinion, is another problem because the Quran, <clears throat> so <laughs> to give context, the Jews had an idea about what is a Messiah, what is a, a Christ, okay? And, and they have this idea about this person who will come and establish peace on earth, and um, this is the Messiah to come. Now, at some point came the Christians, of course, they, they weren't Christians from the get-go, they, they were a Jewish sect, who believed that actually the, the Messiah came and fulfilled all the prophecies and he died on the cross and apparently that peace was not uh, peace on earth as such. Um, it's it's making peace between heaven and earth and uh, being the savior for, for humanity, uh, saving us from eternal sin and uh, so forth. 
that, that that's that's the idea between the the Jewish understanding of the word Messiah and the Christian understanding of the word Messiah. Comes the Quran and calls Jesus Isa ibn Maryam al Masih, which is Jesus, the Messiah. But then he rejects the idea that Jesus was crucified and died on the cross for the sin of man. And at the same time, clearly Jesus didn't establish peace on earth in, in, a, in a worldly sense as the Jews. So he, he, ref, he rejects the idea of, or the view of both the Jewish understanding of the Messiah and the Christian understanding of the word Messiah or Christ. Yeah, he still calls Jesus the Messiah. So in, in what sense, I would like to know, but the Quran doesn't give you any understanding. Right. It seems like the Quran didn't even understand theologically what a Messiah is. That's interesting. Um, almost like the context of earlier centuries and, and the meaning and understanding of these things, especially initially, take on a whole different meaning by someone out of the context that may be using the same language, but don't really know where the original initial uh, context for that theological term is coming from and what is intended. I mean, one could argue that a Messiah was somebody who, who was a political leader uh, that would have been a king or ruler or leader or something like Cyrus the Great. Mm -hmm. Jews saw him as a Messiah. Um, this the language is still kind of used in the New Testament. Jesus is a king. He's supposed to be the king of the Jews. However, he doesn't establish peace on earth. He came to bring a sword. However, there is this theological idea, though, that heaven will come down. The new Jerusalem will come down. The bad will be destroyed. He will rule on a throne. He will be that Messiah the Jews were thinking he was supposed to be. But he had to die first, and the Messiah had to suffer, and then they're still waiting for kind of the Jewish idea to happen. It just mm -hmm. hasn't happened yet. But then you get to, to the Quran, and I imagine, I've heard them say that in the end, Jesus will come in and fulfill those things. So there's some context I think they do bring in, but they don't want him being crucified, some of them. Some of them like trying to hunt for things that might be early in, like, certain versions of Christianity where Jesus didn't really die on the cross. Mm -hmm. We have hints of this, you know what I mean? Yes. In, in the, yes, we, we have in, in, well, the rejected forms of Christianity that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Um, some people will say that it was actually his appearance um, right. on Simon of Cyrene. And mm -hmm. that is, I, I cannot remember exactly the Christian sect that believed that, but it was in the apocryphal uh, gospels. And somehow, again, um, Islam borrows from that. And it, it, it all boils down or comes down to the idea that uh, it seems that the author of the Quran or whoever established the, early, the earliest version of Islam didn't know Judaism from Christianity from the in-betweens. And this entire spectrum was confused in a sense. So he borrowed stories from here, stories from there, and sort of stories from random sects. and. There was no coherence whatsoever. Or maybe he's maybe they're trying to unite by pulling, they're trying to find a middle ground politically that gives enough Christian ideas and enough Jew. I don't know. You know, I mean, there's speculation here. I'm I just, like your idea. <laughs> yeah, but instead the of just saying they don't know, maybe what if they do know and they're like, man, how do we get everyone in one under one umbrella we want everybody to be at peace and get along i've heard some scholars say that in er, in the earliest forms um Jew, jews and judaism and christians were also part of the community and eventually mm -hmm. there's a split and eventually it was like if you're not a muslim if you're not the prophet muhammad is you know the final prophet if you're not like declaring this you're not one of us anymore. And that, that happened over time from what some academics say. I don't know. It's disputed. Which comes, it, it, it comes back to the abrogation. So the early on, it, it, there was no fear. Jews and Christians are good. They're going to go to heaven and they, they, they're right. completely accepted in God's plan. Later on, you find different verses that say, well, no, 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 no. They, they will never go to heaven. They, they are condemned. And then you find the development of the Sunnah and the Hadith, 
um, telling you that they actually should be fought um, or um, pay the jizya. I don't know what's the English word for that, but they they, they pay this uh, money or this fee for the Muslim to uh, to be the ruler, and they have to pay a fee for for Muslims. And until they embrace Muhammad and they embrace Islam, they are, there is no salvation for them. So you, you can see that development happening. So I'm not sure, was it really to unite? Yeah. Because there are clear condemnation on the other end of the story. So, yeah, I mean, again. Yeah, one, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I just figured I'd throw something out there because there's different hypotheses of how, like, how do we understand the Quran? Is it kind of a rolling text that gets established after 30, 40 years? And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, this is the deal. Uh, this is how we, we see things. I, I, I don't know the answer. I do want to ask you one more, um, not as an error thing, but this is the personal thing I wanted to ask. Yeah. You were Muslim, correct? No, I wasn't. I actually was what? born and raised as a Coptic Christian in, okay. in Egypt. Um, but then I, uh, I had my own faith crisis and I, I became agnostic, um, agnostic deist kind of thing a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started the Arabic channel. It, my, my first appearance on YouTube was my Arabic channel, which then grew massively beyond hundred thousand subscribers, 13 million views. And that's what triggered last year to, for me to start the English, uh, channel. Um, that said, because I grew up in Egypt from a very young age, I studied Islam and I studied the Quran and, um, people don't know this, but in order to, to, to study Arabic as a subject in school, you have to study the Quran, regardless of your personal faith. It's just right. like, if you want to study English, you have to study Shakespeare and Charles Dickens. It's like to study Arabic and understand it, you have to memorize chunks of the Quran. And yes, I was Christian, but I knew the Quran from a very young age, from as young as seven years old, I, I memorized parts of the Quran. Growing up, I was very curious. I read interpretations. I really uh, threw myself in the deep, uh, so to speak. And in recent years, after my uh, faith crisis, that's when I really went academically and I did a degree in biblical studies and textual, textual criticism. The focus was on Judeo-Christian traditions, but I took what I learned in terms of textual criticism and how you apply that. And I applied it um, because Arabic is my native tongue. I could apply the tools and what I learned on the Arabic text on the, right. on the Quran. Um, yeah. So, that's so as far as your channel goes, I'd like to know your Arabic channel and then your English channel, how have you been treated uh, overall? If you were to put a, put a percentage on nice or derogatory and nice, like how <laughs> I know that you have to get a lot of hate. Yes. Would so, you say there's more hate than love? I wouldn't say more hate than love. Um, I think I get a lot of comments uh, on on how respectful and, and my style of delivery and I try not to antagonize anyone. The idea right. is I, I present an argument and I want you to listen. So th the nicer I can put my argument, the more chance you will listen to what I have to say. So I'm very respectful and I try to, to remain academic as much as I can. However, you're still challenging someone's faith. Yeah. So some people, that line is blurred. And I get a lot of, um, I wouldn't say more than the nice comments, but I get a lot of um, hate speech. I got death threats. Um, I had to report to the police a couple of times. You have um, what? Death threats, and I had to report it to the police a number of times. Wow. Okay. Um, and yeah, so it, it can get very nasty, but I wouldn't say that the death threats and the hate was more than the nice comments. And Good. like, you know, man, I, I don't agree with what you say, but I respect you. I get okay. that too. I like that. I, I wish more people would do that. That's that's nice. The you being an ex Christian, I was also a Christian, um, different flavor of Christian than you. But as far as your criticisms of Christianity and Islam, I see you, you do focus a lot on Islam here. Tell me what 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 is what is it like? in terms of criticizing Islam versus criticizing Christianity and how have 
how have you been treated by either? Have you done a lot of criticisms of, of Christianity? So I, I have two different approaches on the Arabic channel and the English channel. So on the Arabic channel, <clears throat> I realized that in Arabic, there is hardly anyone uh, who speaks against Christianity in an academic sense. So in, in the Arabic world, we don't have uh, the Bart Ehrman and the uh, Richard Dawkins or anyone who is skeptic or at least academic in biblical studies. Mm -hmm. We don't have this. So when I started the Arabic channel, I was kind of equally criticizing all religions. Uh, I, I, I do have a good chunk Christ, um, criticizing Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. But in the English channel, the, the, the approach changed because in the English world, you have a lot of academic criticism and um, for and against arguments uh, and, and apologetic response. The, the literature is very rich uh, for Christianity and Judaism, but True. you hardly find good material to criticize islam from an academic point and those who uh who do it the <laughs> the usual criticism they get ah but you don't speak the language uh, right. you're a professor such and such but you don't understand the quran really the, the, the guy is a professor and spent his entire life to study the quran so anyway so i i established the english channel while i clearly uh show and, and and tell that my stand is I, i'm not religious i'm not coming from my christian background yet most of my videos focus on islamic criticism because right. i i think this is what is lacking in the english it's world. more of a pressing need you're saying uh, yes is, okay yes got it i figure i'd ask because that i see it as a need as well um i think a lot of people who are atheist uh who are you know being critical uh don't spend enough time i think fairly being critical of all the Abrahamic faith, uh, that includes Islam. And so, but I also want to be very respectful as much as possible in that process. I don't have any goal in going out and just burning down the house of like, ah, you know, that's not my personal goal. My goal is to show you using your mind, being critical, letting people understand people are going to be emotional because it's sensitive. Mm -hmm. But like just using evidence and historical research, you can walk away and and then you can actually enjoy researching it. If you if you get to where I'm at now, I'm not like axe grinding chip on my shoulder. I just I just want to debunk it all. That's fun here and there for me. More of a historical research, like I talked about before we went live. I like finding out how the humans came up with their stories and how they where they borrowed them and how they were inventive and creative and borrowing ideas or even culturally these ideas were in the air, let's say, and they were influenced. I like to do that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, the same goes for Islam. Like I look at it and I'm like, yeah, I don't not convinced at all. Like it's not, this is not convincing just to me like Hinduism. Okay. Yeah. Like I'm not convinced at all, but I love exploring and learning history and things like that. And I think this is an important part of history, along with the rest of the world's re religions and myths and things like that. So um, it I is just fascinating. To... Huh? <clears throat> it is fascinating. This work, the, the, the research and, and, and drawing the lines and making the connections, it really is. It, uh, I do understand you completely because it, it brings me a sense of joy making these links and finding the dots and. <laughs> that's why I, I smiled when you made your last video when you started bringing up Oceanus and you're bringing up uh, Ra and the sunboat and taking them in taking them into the water because you're on the water you know you're floating plus they believed that the blue sky was there were waters above the firmament they believed in a solid dome above us that was hard it was solid rock hard um and that cosmology which is what makes me interested that this cosmology which eventually becomes global in the greek world and you would think in the roman world this would have been something that people started spreading but somehow these ideas still around in the seventh century have that more ancient cosmology that's interesting to me you know that's because yes. if it was global i mean i guess it would give some apologist a little more because this is what we see in the bible there are places where I think some of the literature is written later and may may reflect more of a Greek 
uh, cosmology that comes later. And then an earlier cosmology, ancient Near Eastern, even ancient Greek was not globe. You know, it was later philosophers who discovered this. So you see both. And so what happens is, well, I found a place in my book that sounds global. And then what do you do with all the flat stuff? Oh, well, this one interprets all that, you know? And it's like, ah, yeah, <laughs> try, you'll press man. the other one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've got some super chats. Can we take questions? Are you okay with that? Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Okay. We're going to the beginning here. Yeshua the King. Thanks for the super chat. Always appreciate you popping in the chat. You always do when I'm talking about Islam. That's, that's something I noticed. <laughs> Uh, order of creation seems false. Quran suggests earth and its creatures are before the heavens, 4111. Plus, we know inhabitants came after the smoke form. Mm -hmm. You know about this? Yes. Um, but I would give the exact same argument. Now I'm, I'm going to play the devil's advocate with the Islamic scholar hat. Okay. It's exactly the same thing. So if you read the book of Genesis, you will find that there are two completely different narratives uh, for the creation. Um, chapter one and chapter three, I think. Two. But and, yeah, I know what you mean. Sorry, one and two. Yeah, two uh, but, verse four onward, but yeah. And the order of creating thing, God, God's creation is not the same order. Um, so, right. so the Quran is the same. Um, you, if you really want to read it that way, you have to read all the verses that talk about the creation and see how they contradict each other um i wouldn't take just one verse and say well this is the quran's uh creation story because it's exactly like the bible it has more than one creation story and more than one set of numbers or set of order of things being created um, you have to read it coherently i gotta just give you a shout out man and the reason is is you're you do what i do you try to be fair. A lot of people use, you know, their tools against the faith they don't like, uh, especially when it's Christian versus Muslim. You know what I mean? You see it all the time. And I think that's why many Muslims like me, even if they think, D, I can't disagree with you more. I believe, you know, I'm, I'm a Muslim, whatever. I think they like me. And that's because I'm quick to go. Yep. Yeah, but the Bible says, blah, 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 blah. The Bible also says, and the New Testament also says, and like, you're fair. Right. I'm trying to be. Everyone has a bias, but I truly am trying to be honest and fair and respectful along the way because I want to be treated. I hope you want to be treated the same way, vice versa, golden rule. So great answer. I love it. I agree with you. Um, you've got like the idea of the sun later. Um, yep. but you have light in verse one in Genesis one. You have you have interesting uh, problems that come up and then later the order of man being created. And anyway, uh, I think man's created first and then animals are created for him. And then all sorts of theologians will come in and go, but those animals aren't the animals of Genesis one. Those animals were made specifically for Adam in that garden at that time. Yeah. And the list. Of <laughs> uh, Yeshua, the King again. Thank you. Quran 30, 27. Um, says something is easier for God. This word yeah, is only yeah. used once and everywhere else. It says easy. It uses, I don't, I can't read this easier and all powerful. Okay. Let, let me read. That says something easier. Ahwan. Ahwan means easier or lighter for God. This word is only used once and everywhere else. It says easy to use. Sayir or Hayin. Easier and all powerful. <sighs> I, I agree with you um, because if you if we're talking about God being all powerful, you wouldn't expect words like it was easier for him to do. Why does it even matter if it's easier for him or not? If we're talking right. about an all powerful uh, creator, um, however, the three Arabic words here that you put um, so. Hayyin or Sayyir, the, the, the two Arabic words on the bottom line, these actually mean easy or light, kind of, while Ahwan means easier than. So it's not just easy, but easier than. And that mm -hmm. is the reason for the question, I guess, uh, Yeshua the King uh, is asking, why would you put easier than if we're talking about an all-powerful God? Well, I agree with you, <laughs> to be honest. Um, 
it, it's a weird term to use when we're talking about an all-powerful God. That's interesting. It shows yeah. kind of a maybe the author, a human idea, you know, to try and understand. They're they're like trying to draw this picture, but maybe it's also kind of a, a mistake if if they're thinking omniscient, all powerful, omnipotent, the whole nine, and they're they're writing in the human's mind. I could see myself making the simple mistake of going like, you know, it was easier for God to do this than it was for that, and. Uh, but not realize like, whoops, I mean, <laughs> Bible also has, again, plenty of situations where he doesn't know. Uh, and there's theologians who want to come in and go, actually, he did. But it's an anthropomorphic statement that's trying to make you understand because you wouldn't understand because you're human. And like there's always <laughs> the same thing in this situation. Uh, a Muslim apologist will come and say, well, look, the way we humans understand things is this way. But we know that that's not the case for God. You see what I'm saying? Uh, absolutely. But this will take us back to the point that we discussed earlier, that you can make that apologetic response when we're talking about the Bible. Because, yes, these are people who wrote the book. Right. Right. Uh, so, yes, language is tricky. And, and you can fall into linguistic mistakes because at the end of the day, humans are the author, uh, the authors of, of, the, of the book. But when, when you put the, the Quran as God is the author of that, well, he cannot really fall into it was easier for what do you mean easier for you? Like you're you're the person who wrote it. <laughs> I see what you mean. Yeah, it becomes more of a difficult. I don't know how you get around. Challenge. That <laughs> yeah, exactly. but there are some direct things, even if humans wrote. Uh, but that's a whole nother that's a whole nother can of worms biblically speaking of like totally agree questions of like uh, <laughs> they had iron chariots so we couldn't win the war because they had iron chariots things like these ideas like god couldn't overcome them um <laughs> all things. so yeshua the king all these verses seem to contradict 448 and 4116 basically how many unforgivable sins are there well i i don't know these verses on top of my head just How looking can at the you number not know? I thought you were omniscient. I mean, it's easier <laughs> to know certain things than others for you. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, do you know? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. The argument. Sorry, say again. Do you know anything about this argument? This. N -n not really. I, I, unless I take every verse and put it in Google and, and pull that verse, because even that's that's an interesting thing. When when we. When we read the Quran in Arabic, we don't usually use the surah numbers. They have names. So you, you often hear surah al-Kahf or surah al-Baqarah, um, surah and name. While in the English world, you will find them more often using the surah number, surah right. number four, surah number two. So I definitely don't know the surah by the numbers. If, if you tell me surah al-Baqarah verse such and such, maybe I know it, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. I have a limited memory here. <laughs> I think it's because we have Bible verses and chapters and it's, so yeah, it's, used it's to much Bible. easier that way. Exactly. T totally. The same for Matt. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, wow. Okay. Thank you, uh, Yeshua. Um, I mean, I would, but that's a lot of like pulling up every single individual thing. If you have a way of like, I don't know, uh, compressing this into something simplified where the, the idea you're trying to get out is, is explained please yeah. feel free to let me know and I'll try and keep my eye out in the chat. He's I'm very Hines. interested. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say something about um, Yeshua King because his, his, um, his icon is very interesting. It says Aaron, son of God, which is, uh, which is a very interesting uh, thumbnail, has Arabic writing on it. And usually we, we would write Jesus, son of God, but it's actually written as Aaron, son of God, which is, huh. uh, it was remarkable. <laughs> okay okay heezy hines says this guy's a known liar whether you accept our faith or not i want a dialogue with him in person or at minimum on camera with no audience um i am open to have um a live chat um however so a few comments here if you really want to have a chat with me it is not good to start your your <laughs> comment but this guy is a known liar and i want to have a chat with him like <laughs> why do you want to really have like this guy is a criminal and awful and i want to have a chat with him these right. two don't really uh, sit together 
And also my question for you, um, Hazy Hines, why why with no audience? Like if, if you really are confident that I am a liar and I present something completely false and you can expose me in a way, why the no audience? So if, if you can please um, clarify your comment, um, I would like to know why you want to have a chat with a liar and why no audience, if you can prove me wrong. Interesting. Yeah, a lot was said in that $5. Thank you for the super chat. <laughs> Callie, since the last supper chat, called the guest a liar. Oh, last super chat, supper, supper. <laughs> <laughs> called the guest a liar. I'm going to subscribe to his channel and watch all the videos. <laughs> Thank you so much, Callie. <laughs> really oh, appreciate that's it. funny. Oh, Someone's going to super chat after because Callie said, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. It's so funny. I get a lot of comments on my channel and they, they all have this, this guy is a liar. I'm like, okay, please prove me. a liar. Don't just come and make a claim that I'm a liar or I'm delusional or whatever. I, I completely agree. You have your own right to believe that I am uh, delusional or I'm wrong. You can say that, but at least prove that I'm a liar. Say that yeah. he said X, Y, Z while that doesn't exist. Or, But making the claim just this guy is a liar doesn't do it for me. Right, right, right. I'm with you. I, I, I agree. It doesn't help the conversation. Notion slave. Mary, sister, daughter isn't uncommon. With other figures within close communities are brothers. Check out 765, 773, 785. If Dulcarnine is Alexander, Jews also have legends about him. You need to do a lot more research. Mm. So these are two separate <clears throat> things. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, I know that there is there's a very, very uh, famous uh, or, or well-known, um, how do you say that? common saying that you would say yeah Arab," which means you brother of the arabs yes i know that it is common i know it's not like it's uncommon but what is really uncommon and i challenge you to give me one example that you get one character uh, labeled as sister of x daughter of y and that was just uh, a, a common thing, and it's not uh, it's not a mixed identity. The problem with Mary specifically is not sister slash daughter; it's actually sister and daughter. That what makes the case very uncommon and rare. It's sister and daughter, not sister slash daughter. Um, if Dulcarnain is Alexander, Jews also have legends about him. I know, and and I. <laughs> we already said this earlier. I'm not sure if there correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm not sure if we said it in the live or before the live. We said that uh, Alexander the Great, we had we we have legends about him that he was trying to spread Christianity. And yes, Absolutely. he was trying to present it was before the live. So, so I maybe think, I needed to I don't array that. We talked about it. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> we said it was both Jewish and like we agree with the super chatter here that yeah. this, the legends of Alexander the Great predated the Quran that were Jewish and Christian ideas. Um, obviously, we even see hints of this in Josephus. We know Follow of Alexandria. I think Follow of Alexandria makes sense of this. I know Josephus makes a huge deal. And 100%. there is Christian and Jewish legend about door or not dual Quran, but as alexander the great so you get into mm -hmm. the uh quran what i was pulling up just so people know and the person you should look at this guy right here that's the face of him that's just one of the interviews if you're curious to see my old interview with him it's this one alexander the great is dual Quran. um and we go in and he goes into the sources but you can you can get his his read his work here on uh, academia.edu or you could just, I could just read this like thing here real quick. I feel like I'm interrupting you though, where you, you were trying to get to something. And uh, now I, I basically, I agree with the second half of the comment that yes, there are many legends and Alexander romance was really spread in uh, nearly every culture and every language before and after uh, the Quran and Islam. So 
there is no one figure that had enough um, legends and, and myths about him uh, more than Alexander. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to make out of this. I, I think the Quran, like any other culture, fell into the same legends and um, mythology about Alexander the Great. And by the way, legends and myth aside, if you read the earliest Islamic sources, and uh, there are a lot of hadith that, sorry, the lot, a lot of tafsir books, uh, tafsir means interpretation of the Quran, they confirm that Dhul Qarnain is Alexander the Great. So even the earliest Muslims, some of them believe Dhul Qarnain to be Alexander the Great. The idea that now Muslim scholars completely reject this is more and more evidence came to prove that Alexander the Great is a pagan uh, king. And of course, the Quran now cannot fall into the mistake of praising a pagan king. Now it becomes problematic. But in ancient past, when he wasn't known to be pagan and he was spreading Christianity and spreading Judaism and he was such a righteous man, the Quran had no, and early Muslims had no problems considering Dhul uh, Alexander the Great. So, Yeah, well, I think um, the legend goes something like the Daniel bumps into, I think it's Daniel. I think Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith, gosh, Joseph. <laughs> Now I'm jumping over the morning. I don't even know where I'm at now. Um, but he mentions something about a prophecy about Alexander the Great, and supposedly he sees this, and he sees the Jews and gives them a thumbs up and honors their God, so that that's kind of a nod, kind of like Cyrus the Great is seen as Messiah. Mm -hmm. Anyone who does any historical research on Cyrus the Great will find out, like Ahura Mazda, Zoroastrianism was his religion. He was not a Jew. He did not worship Yahweh. He did not worship the God of Israel. He was worshiping a different God. But because he was so politically in some way favoring what the Jews wanted by going back and rebuilding the temple and stuff like that, he was seen as a Messiah figure. Alexander the Great gets used that way. And I think he's like the best military example that they had in the world of being a conqueror. And so they imagined anyone who could do that, God's, God's got to be with them. So combine the idea that the Jews saw him as a figure who bowed down to their God and worshiped their God. Historically, we now know the guy was a, poly, he was a polytheist. The guy had all these other gods that he worshiped. He was even made into a God in Egypt. Um, he had, uh, you know, few male partners. So same sex relationships, all sorts of stuff. And you wouldn't know that if you're just, you know, separated from that historical evidence and you don't know this material. And you might think he's an honorable man of God and he has the same ideas that you do because that's what the legend does is it turns and gives its own spin in its own context. That's what I think is happening here. Yeah. But come to find out, oh my gosh, this guy is <laughs> not what we thought he was. So it couldn't be that guy. <laughs> it has to be someone yeah. else. He's you know? pagan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, and also, yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. Please. Also, Alexander the Great, on every single coin that he, um, what's the word? Uh, the numismatic evidence. The min coin. Minted, or yeah. yeah. So every every coin he produced, he presented himself as Dul Qarnain. Dul Qarnain literally means the two horned uh, one. And Alexander the Great, in all his depictions, on all his coins that circulated the globe at that time, he was the two-horned uh, king. So, again, that's also another... If you want to ignore that, I don't know what you make out of this. This is something that I don't know if viewers knew this, but it's worth pointing out. I, I discovered this not too long ago while I was researching Greco-Roman material, mainly Greek material. As I was looking in the Near East and understanding why do these kings have horns? Like, you know, we always think of the Vikings with horns on their head. Why do they have horns? Usually animal horns. The horns represent divinity. Yeah. It's the same problem you had. Like, why are they borrowing the concept of Jesus as the Messiah, but then they don't use the concept for what it really meant initially? This is the same problem with the horns because that symbol is a symbol that this person is a god or a son of a god. In its original context, 
he claimed, I mean, the history has it that he claimed to be a descendant of one of the deities. So he was a son of God and who claimed to be one. And when he died, of course, they had all these stories about how he did become a God. Um, that again, the horns, it loses its meaning after seven, eight, nine hundred years, a thousand years later. And they don't see why the two horned one is actually in its original context saying this guy was cannot a be a good man. Huh? Cannot be a good man. It's it's already problematic calling him Dulkarnain, the two horned man, right. already makes it problematic because he cannot be other than pagan. He has hmm. to be pagan son of God which is a concept that Quran completely rejects. Yet right. he called him Dr. Kanain, right? So it's a brilliant point that you just raised mm -hmm. because you need to look at what is the meaning of Dr. Kanain. Regardless who, of, of who he is, whether he was Alexander, Cyrus, whoever the hell he was, <laughs> the fact right. that he was Dr. Kanain, the two-horned one, is already problematic in that term. You just got to go back in time and see what the horns symbolize. And then you'll realize, whoa, this is a really interesting fact about how people viewed horns on their crowns or as helmets with horns. Uh, they saw themselves as divine figures. Maximus, uh, 1975. Thanks for the video. Thank you. Very welcome. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Thank, thank you for the love you. today. Um, live long legacy. You got this. Thank you for the super chat <laughs> and being a member of our channel. Thank you. Uh, I hope you'll subscribe over Adam's channel as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morpheus says, and I think the next one also complements this one. So I'm going to give you both here, if that's okay. Mr. Morpheus says, please show the error in dual core nine sun setting in water, please, which is the last video that you did. We, we already kind of covered this, but you know, uh, just for the sake of brevity, maybe you can recap. And then George Paul says, shout out to my friend, Adam. Can you please uh, comment? <laughs> I think this is related that start with have you not seen like the people of the elephant or is that a different question? Uh, can you please comment on the verse that starts with have you not seen Awalam Tar <laughs> like the people of the elephant? That must be a different that, question or it's 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 a different uh, it's a different surah it's a different chapter altogether. Awalam okay. yara ashabul uh, ashabul I'm not sure if, if if George, you can put it in Arabic just to uh, remind me of the actual verse, and I, I will be able to read it in Arabic on the screen. Okay, um, George, I so there's two sections on my on my Streamyard. One is the Patreon or the uh, Patreon. The super my chats. brain ain't working today. <laughs> the super chat section, and then the regular live chat section. I only have the super chat section open, but I can open the other one if you want to try and keep my eye out for George's. Um, comment um let's get back to mr morpheus just to recap on the dual carnine sun setting in the water we did cover this earlier because this his past past video was on this but can you recap what the argument is and how you see this as a problem or an error so uh, and i will elaborate on it more as well so the, the quran details the story of dual carnine um and how he roamed the earth so he went uh, uh, as far uh, west as possible and he saw the sun setting in muddy water um, he, he went to the west and وَجَدَهَا تَغْرُبُ فِي عَيْنٍ حَمِئَةً find the sun to be setting in muddy pool or muddy water and then he went all far east to find the sun uh, rising on people who did not have any shelter or anything to protect them the the interesting thing is that the two verses that says and Dulqarnain went west and found the sun setting and then the following verse verse 90 that says and then he went to the far east and he found the sun rising the two verses are identical in arabic words however if you look at the english translation you will find the sun setting he found translated as it appeared to him as if setting in water but the other found in the sunrise, he found the sun to be actually rising on people. So, so that shows you the manipulation of the translation, how the very same word, when it is problematic, let's twist the meaning a bit. When it is not problematic, let's keep the meaning as it is. He found the sun to be rising on people with no shelter. 
Um, so that is the, the problem. And of course, we know today that the sun doesn't set in water. It is something that the ancients believed uh, according to their cosmology or cosmological uh, narrative at the time. Um, and it seems like the Quran borrowed the, the same myths and legends about uh, the water setting, uh, the sun setting in water. Um, we, we, we mentioned that was uh, in Greek mythology as God Helios uh, pulled the sun towards Oceanus, a body of water, and takes the, the sun there. So it was widespread, and it seems like it found its way through the, to the Quran. Thank you for recapping for Mr. Morpheus. Thank you so much, Mr. Morpheus. Um, getting George here. Let me see if George commented down at the bottom here. I'm trying to make triple, quadruple sure. Oh, here it is. Yep. <laughs> I think. Um, so literally, I I'll just translate George's... Um, my nose is Arabic. big and ugly. No, I'm just kidding with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, haven't, haven't you seen what God, your God, have done by those? Ashab al-Fil means those who were riding the elephants or those who came with the elephants. And he makes a funny comment. That says, well, actually, no, we haven't seen. Because the, the verse is actually written, haven't you seen what happened with those who came on the elephants? Actually, no, no one saw that. Who, who, uh, so, who's talking here? Just so I so, know the context. So God, God is talking in the Quran in an actual verse. The verse says, Haven't you seen what happened to those who came on the elephants? Um, and in fact, this is no related to the Quran 9, isn't it? No, it is is related to another incident where allegedly uh this king from Ethiopia somehow came to the Kaaba. In, in the Arabic Peninsula on elephants, and um, he tried to destroy the, the Kaaba uh, of, of the Muslims. And um, God intervened, uh, sending some form of birds flying and dropping rocks on them, uh, killing them and, and, and saving the, the Kaaba. It, it's very interesting and ironic because later in, in, in Islamic history, the, the Kaaba was destroyed about three times, but Somehow, Muslims believe that in this particular incident, when they came on the elephants, God throws to send birds with stones and protected the Kaaba, but he didn't really bother the three other times that the Kaaba was completely demolished and destroyed. Hmm. And yeah, we haven't seen the, the elephants anyway. It was a funny, uh, funny comment from George. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, my George. friend. Thank you. Uh, Colt Coria. Thank you for the super chat. Great work bo by both of you. Please keep going. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Wade Rogers in the house. Is there a correlation between Allah, a male deity, replacing Allah, the pre-Islamic Arabian goddess who was worshipped across Arabia? Was her worship replaced by the worship of Allah? Salam. There are arguments for that. Yes, there, there was uh, two very famous deities in the ancient times of uh, in, in Arabia known as Alat wal Uzza. Um, and uh they were uh, female uh, goddess so is there a correlation probably however there are many academic arguments where the term allah came from there is a the, there's an argument that it is just a uh, alif lam which is the and la is actually god so it, it just translates as the god and it has no correlation to allah of course that's the apologetic response there are a number of arguments, but yes, one of them, there is a correlation uh, between uh, Alat and Allah. Um, depends which argument you want to embrace or find it more convincing. Interesting. I've never um, really investigated that one. But I definitely have heard that uh, the, like, philologically, the the name Allah does come over from El. uh mm -hmm. In in but there's still a name I believe an Arabic name for God that goes back there might that might be of pagan significance that isn't related to the Jewish concept so I there's so much uh, there's just I gotta I gotta do my study you know uh, <laughs> Mr Morpheus is back again how can Muhammad be born four years after the death of his so-called father and his name is it Kitam 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 this is a very 
slippery slope here um because i don't want to offend it so even even i if i am criticizing uh islam and the quran i don't want to uh get to this particular argument because it's very dear to muslims and it really hurts badly uh whenever you talk about a very highly respected figure a revered figure and basically you're making an argument for this person to be a son of sin as as they say in arabic it is very offensive for them so okay. to answer this question actually i'll i'll, I'll put the uh, muslim scholar hat and i'll play the devil's advocate here and say um well we cannot really prove that he was uh, born four years uh, after the death of his father because this whole narrative came much later in life so there is more chance that the narrative is wrong in islamic tradition than the prophet to be uh, a son of sin so as far as let me just get this context correct because i have not heard <laughs> anything related to this before right. and i want to relate it to christianity to take it off the hot spot for a second there is a <laughs> right. tradition there is a tradition there is a well-known one in the jewish world that is also used by non-christians um Celsus or Celsus, depending on how you pronounce it, they claim that Jesus was born by his mother, uh, slept with a Roman soldier. Mm -hmm. And so she wasn't a virgin. She conceived out of wedlock. She had a sexual relationship with a Roman soldier, and then he was born. So this is coming from critics, uh, people who don't agree with Christianity. Um, is there something like this is going in the direction of what you're suggesting is the argument that really that's not his dad or what is, what is the argument? I don't understand. So, so the argument is, so <clears throat> there are, uh, narratives that say that says that the prophet was born four years after, uh, his father's death. If, if you work out the dates, his father died at the year such and such, he, but then Muhammad was born. Uh, year such and such with which is four years later okay now muslims look at it those who believe in that narrative they look at it as a miracle okay but it's of course for a non-believer uh, clearly it wasn't a miracle it all it could mean that his mother slept with someone else who was unknown and it's like like the story you mentioned about jesus now Right. Uh, which is, but to Muslim, it's it's far more offensive than the Jesus story. Wow. It, yes. Uh, to, to to think that Prophet Muhammad was born uh, out of a uh, an adultery act is is a very offensive claim. I don't uh, know how. I mean, maybe maybe that's because you're seeing how critical, like when you're being critical, how the reactions are. Mm -hmm. Christians, I mostly. I mean, there are some that are just toxic if you are pointing out arguments like let me be let me be very frank i was a christian i believe that jesus was born of a virgin this you did too uh when you yes, were of course <laughs> um and i think there was probably a guy who G named jesus who was born i think if that is the case then either joseph is the dad or someone else is the dad I do not believe a miracle happened to make this guy get born. Um, I know for a fact that any criticism of the virgin birth, if you think she slept with Joseph even, if you think she didn't have the baby as a virgin birth, is offensive to many Christians. If you yeah. say that some other man, that's even more offensive to them. But um, it seems that you're suggesting that the criticisms you know, there are people that are using this, like it's so sensitive. Being critical of Islam is way more sensitive than being critical of Christianity. Is that what you're trying to hint at? Yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm saying that the exact same claim is not so hurtful to uh, a Christian's feelings as much as the same claim would be so much hurtful to a Muslim person. Why do you think that is? Are they just not used to criticism? And that's that's one reason <laughs> they are not used to criticism. For for well, look at it this way: for for the majority of history, Islam persecuted, and that's that's clear in in Quran, in in Hadith, in Sunnah, in in everything. 
Islam persecuted anything that uh, anyone who criticized Islam openly. And I dare anyone to challenge this claim that I'm making. Anyone who spoke against Islam or was Muslim and left had the ridda, they were persecuted. They, 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 they were uh, killed, basically. Now, I would take it further that there are actual hadith sahih, a number of them, not just one, that anyone who would um, not criticize would insult the Prophet in any way, they should be put to death. That is the commandment in, in Islam. There are actual true hadith that there were people who mocked the Prophet or insulted him and uh, people took revenge and killed the, the, the offender and they were later praised by the prophet himself like good on you for killing that person because they mocked me we're, we're talking about a different story altogether so for mm -hmm. centuries and centuries those people who dare to mock the prophet or or make fun of him or say anything nasty or offensive um disappeared from the face of history and the faith of earth earth uh so yes muslims are not used to these kind of claims um the the, the narratives tell them that be, these people should be killed and it's it's quite uh, hurtful or offensive it's a big offense um, so things when, when when you read stories like charlie Hebdo or, or any of these attacks it, it has very strong merits and roots in islamic traditions and mm -hmm. in, it doesn't come out of nowhere so. I just, um, you know, wanted you to spell that out. And so I, I thank you for taking the time to do that. That was what I was thinking you were going to say. I just wanted it to be heard uh, from people. And I hope that changes. That is my goal. Um, I don't expect everybody to not be Muslim. <laughs> I can't make Christians see that their Christianity, you know, is, is obviously, I would say, man-made. I think the same thing about Islam, but I hope that we can change that. That's the thing. And I know I get a lot of crap from some of the people who are critis who are critical of Islam, who get labeled Islamophobic because they're so, it's like all they do, you know, is, is criticize Islam. And, um, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't just do that. If anything, that's something I'll occasionally do because I mainly know Christianity. I know my Bible and I'm really deep into all of that. But it's sad when that, you know, they, they feel like they have to be so critical to like destroy Islam's existence instead of help reform people to think differently. Because I think because that's Islam is so resistant to reformation. That's that, that, that's the problem that we're facing with Islam. <clears throat> Christianity, when it did all the nasty things and, and killed a lot of people, it was the abuse of authority by the church. Mm -hmm. But there weren't really clear commands coming from authoritative texts that tell you Jesus. anyone that criticizes Jesus to be killed. Right. But we have that for, for the prophet. We have that in Islam. This is why Christianity was more open for reformation a few centuries ago while until today islam is very resistant to reformation hmm. and the only way in my opinion for this approach is to be very gentle that's what i try, try to do in my channel is that i always nearly in every video i say well i stand for your right to believe i stand for diversity and inclusion but i also need the criticism of this because that's the only way moving forward yeah I'm with you. I, I agree with you. And I'm, again, their, you know, beliefs aside, I appreciate you being the way you are, being gentle, trying to be polite and understanding. Because something I see in you is empathy. You have a very understanding approach. You know, not everybody is not everybody may have awareness of the things you've learned, or they may not be able to. There are certain emotional reasons people can't think a certain way. I know, and I say this all the time on my channel, and you probably would agree with me. Imagine meeting yourself when you were at the height of your belief. 
you met yourself and tried to have that conversation with yourself. Yeah. How would you, how would you want to communicate to yourself? Would you yell at yourself? Would you treat yourself bad? Would you try to insult? No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. You know that that would not persuade you into seeing the evidence and following through. That's not what it did for me. I've heard some people say, Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins, very harsh. That convinced me. It didn't convince me. I didn't like those guys. They yeah. were too rough. I only started to hear them later and went, actually, they're right about that. Or you know what I mean? Like I, I couldn't listen to that when I was first like getting into this stuff. The apologists that debated them were my, my heroes. I agree yes. with them. <laughs> I didn't like them. I liked the apologists who debated them. And then later on down the road, I realized the evidence wasn't on the apologist's side, but I still wouldn't want to carry that rhetoric. I wouldn't necessarily want that because I want people to change. And I don't think creating that us versus them tension helps. That's, that's why, that's why I think even if people disagree with me, they say, you're nice. You know, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's good. Same for you, man. And I, I love that about you, you too. And, and yes, hundred percent. I agree with you and, and thank you for, for acknowledging that. And maybe part of that, I'm not sure if you you know or, or the audience know that what I do outside of the channel, um, I am a religious trauma therapist wow. as well as a counselor. So I try to, to uh, walk the walk and talk the talk, as they say. Um, so I help my clients. Basically, what, what they need is hand-holding, not a slap on the face. And that's wow. what I try to do. Um, I, I'm not in the business of converting anyone. I'm in the business of doing healthy criticism. If it resonates with you, you can embrace it. If it doesn't be my guest and please stop watching my channel. Like I'm not forcing anyone to see something that will make their life miserable. Right. Um, and when, when I get a client who's from a, a Muslim background, who's still on the, like they did, they don't know what to do. My role is not to convert them into an atheist or a Christian or anything. My right. role is to meet you where you are. You make that decision and I'm here to support you. So, so that's, that's my approach. And um, yeah, if, if you go on my website, you will find nothing about the channel. You will actually find all about my work in psychology and therapy. That speaks, now, I, <laughs> now it makes sense. Now I understand why you are that way. You understand people. And I do too, not from a clinical research. I didn't go to school. I just lived a really rough, tough life. And I've gone through drug addiction. Um, and I think that that experience of going through and meeting people in a 12-step room from all different backgrounds, but we all had a, a common goal and we could come together on one thing. And it wasn't, it wasn't, color, race, creed, politics. It was, I'm, I, I'm a recovering alcoholic or a recovering drug addict. My name's Derek. And it was like, oh, okay. And we all could hear each other. We found a common thing. So yeah, that's, man, it gets deep. It gets deep, but I definitely appreciate you for that. I'm glad you told me that. And now, now I understand. <laughs> um, a few more here. I got uh, Notion Slave again. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. I appreciate that. Uh, if trusted all the New Testament about who Jesus was, you could think you could think Jesus claimed to be God, whereas he did not. The same could be of Alexander, whose biographies were written by polytheists some 300 to 400 years later. A possibility. I'll let you read it again. <laughs> I have my own responses. Yeah. If trust, well, you, you can go with your response um, okay, while see, I really please. let this sink in. <laughs> so this is, I tend to agree with you that I don't think that a Jewish guy, apocalyptic Jewish guy was claiming to be God. Um, but I can't say that I know for sure that that wasn't the case. It seems less likely personally especially if he was saying the Shema and he was believing in one God. I have a hard time thinking a Jew would claim to be a son of God. Um, but they did write legend about him, obviously, and they portray him as a God. 
And that could, at this time in history, it wasn't like the way that Muslims view Allah. It was more like there were levels to this. So you could be a God and there was still a supreme God. You could call it henotheism. But whether Jesus himself saw himself that way, I doubt it. I'm with you. As far as the biographies go, the same could be of Alexander, whose biographies were written by polytheist some 300 or 400 years later. A possibility. Imagine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it around. Just, just think with me for a second. You could disagree with me and that's fine. But all of the Muslim commentaries, the Muslims who wrote the biographies of Muhammad, they wrote them a couple hundred years later. I know, I know, they, they claim they have a chain of command that goes back. But, but listen, all of these people are hyper monotheist and they're trying to portray Muhammad as if he really was this way. But, but to be very honest with you, he wasn't. He was another way that you don't know. Now imagine how, I know that's insulting to someone who's faithful, but imagine if I told you that you thinking the sources of people who were Greek, who were polytheist, and he was a Greek who was a polytheist, but he wasn't a polytheist because it was written 300 to 400 years later. You want probably, if you're Muslim, you want me to believe we need to go almost a thousand years later to trust your account of something that far back, that doesn't make sense to me. It's not the most plausible explanation is my point. So I would rather go, here's a Greek who's a ruler. We have actual archeological evidence of the guy being called and equated with divinities and sons of gods. We have inscriptions, stones, even if the biographies of him are later, we have evidence of him being deified and seen this way right there out the gate. I get it. You say Jesus the same way. It only took a decade or two before they wrote these stories about Jesus. I understand. Thousand years almost? I mean, that's, that's you know, that's not the best uh, approach to me on understanding the material. So what are your thoughts? I love your response. <laughs> That's my first thought. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I love this argument that you made about how also what was written about Prophet Muhammad was written hundreds of years later. And yes, if it, that argument, the, the chain of narration is, is a completely broken argument. Just look at the Sunnah and the Shia, two sects of Islam. They completely disagree on the chain of narratives. So that's uh, just a quick comment. And also... Something um, slightly different about Alexander, that the biographies that were written about him uh, three, four hundred years later, uh, we, we have the development of, of that. We, we ha so something like the Alexander Romance, we have copies from 300 BC all the way to uh, year 800 or something, like after Islam. We, we have... Uh, the stories and the accounts of Alexander the Great over a period of seven, sorry, not seven, about nine uh, centuries, 900 years of development. And we can see what are the earliest accounts and how they were, were modified and what was written later and how something was taken from Josephus and input there and how the Quran influenced later uh, legends that were written after Islam. We can see the development. Right. So when, when you look at it in context, it's not like we, we pick and choose what we believe about Alexander and what's not. We, we see how he was perceived at that time, at that time, at that time. And it's not like we drop the whole thing because, ah, they were written three, four hundred years later. Uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a bit different. Yeah. And I tend to go with, like we talk about historical methodology. I, I'd be curious to know if there's a single expert on Alexander the Great, the Greek and Roman empires and just really the Greek context here, a classicist, a single academic. I know this is a, a fallacy of, of, you know, what is the consensus here? What does the majority think? But I would be impressed to find a single academic ever that's a classicist expert that knows the Greek, that knows the archaeology, that knows all of this, that would ever say that he was not a polytheist <laughs> and that would ever say he did not like see himself divine or that would say that the horns don't represent divinity or like give me anyone any evidence and i'm i'm interested to hear i will be like whoa where did this guy come from because every scholar i know 
that researches this, and they don't do it for religion reasons. They have no ax to grind. They don't have a reason to make him polytheist. Mm -hmm. If they found out that he was secretly a monotheist who worshiped only one God, they'd be like, wow, this king, <laughs> wow, what are the odds? This guy in this world of, of polytheism, they might could come up with it. Plato had kind of a polytheistic philosophy. So he had the good, the ultimate good, and the crafter that was above all. Even though there were lower gods like Zeus and all these other deities, um, there was an ultimate deity that was one. And so in a way, he was somewhat uh, henotheistic, but a, a monotheist. And one could argue, well, was Alexander the Great also in line with Plato? But uh, he was worshipped uh, while he was alive, according to accounts. So I'm I'm really questioning the whole thing. I, and I wouldn't go even, to 900 years later, you know. Even some early church fathers put Plato as a Christian. Yes. They considered him as as a Christian as, and as a, as a saint. Uh, so which what happened with Alexander too. So you, yeah. you, you draw the parallels. Play, uh, Justin Martyr actually does that. He he's he was arguing with Platonist as well. So he was arguing with these Roman Greek Roman Platonist, and then yet still equates Plato into the school. It's another one of those tactics. I was saying, like, I wonder if the Quran's author or authors had in mind, like, how do you get? I'll give you an example. Some scholars argue that the John the Baptist sect, there was a Jewish movement of John the Baptist. And they think that the authors of the gospels paint this picture for, to try and like say, Hey, John the Baptist, look at what Jesus said about John the Baptist of, of men born or of, of men born of women. None are greater than John. So you guys who follow John the Baptist, you, you know, now that he's dead, cause he's dead. And we have Josephus say he was like literally killed. It doesn't say he was beheaded like the gospel, but he was killed um, by, I believe it was Herod. I could think it was Herod, but Josephus accounts us. Um, it's, it's to convince the people who followed him, Hey, our group, we've got room for you. We, we actually admire your people and your teachings and your ideas. And then it goes further, of course, in the context to say, but even John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to unravel his sandals. Like he's so like, yeah, you wonder if they're giving here's some context for Jews and here's some context for the Christian idea. Let's come together. Bring in, together. Uh, yes. You know, which is exactly what happened between Paul and Seneca as well. That, that, that there are apocryphal uh, yeah. books, uh, well, epistles between uh, Paul and Seneca that Paul is one of the amazing philosophers of Greek. A again, it's, it's just to to elevate the status of our guy, but at the same time, leave room for others to embrace our guy. Mm. Thank you, Notion Slave. I hope that answered the question, though. Thank you. Cold Korea? Uh, forgive me if I'm butchering your last name. <laughs> Both of you are really doing a great service. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for real. I really appreciate that. Uh, showing quite a lot of love tonight. Mr. Morpheus, did Muhammad worship idols? He is told in Surah al Mudathir. Al Mudathir, yes. Surah al Mudathir, yeah. Stop worshiping idols. Stop worshiping idols. Well, if you want to take it at face value, then yes, it, it, it says here, stop worshiping idols. However, again, there, there are arguments that he could have worshipped idols. He also, at, at a later stage in life, he destroyed the idols around the Kaaba. So, it when when you say did Muhammad worship idols, what at what age or at what phase? Um, he, he definitely worshipped idols before uh, before he embraced Islam or be, before his forties, basically. Uh, before he became the, the prophet Muhammad, he was worshipping idols. But is your question saying that after he delivered the Quran, was he still worshipping idols? Possibly not. But it took him some time until he really rejected the idols and dared to go and, and attack the idols around the Kaaba and destroy them. 
that's where the um the real controversial satanic uh passages people will bring in where he some not all wonder if they're authentic the ones who might think it's authentic the way i understood it was he was trying to persuade the community that worshiped these other gods to join islam mm -hmm. but they wanted these i think they're called cranes is, is it they're called cranes they're goddesses they they call them cranes or something the three the three goddesses or something right. um and he like accepts it at first and then is like actually no uh he rejects it later and but after he like wins them over or something he like wins them and then he changes his mind and then like they're like well hold on what happened here and even some of the people that were on his side were like muhammad what are you doing like you're accepting so i i probably butchered that it's been a while since <laughs> i've read anything on it but it's something to that effect and it makes you wonder if like is this i don't know the context of this but if he was a polytheist or believed in several gods before he was called is that what this is referring to i don't know the context though yeah and there is a there is a very famous uh, story in islamic tradition and of course some muslim apologists will say it's it's uh, it's a hadith daif week uh, but it, it's a it's an interesting story that says when muhammad was um revealing or reciting one of the verses uh he actually encouraged um people to worship two of the famous idols in in around mecca at that time and then later uh came the abrogation and he removed these two idols from from the verse and when he was uh questioned he then uh said that any prophet when he got a revelation from god satan would come and throw in things that are not meant to be said but then god will come back and correct these errors and remove the the ones that are not meant to to be in and and uh protects or seals his verses to be true um so yeah at, at some point you can argue that muhammad actually praised some of the idols around the kaaba uh only to abrogate that at a later point if that's historical because i you know me i don't look i'm not just here to like just find problems if i like i like getting into the weeds of what the scholars say about like actually this doesn't seem like it has historical pedigree looks like this is propaganda later between debates of various muslims whatever but if that is historical and goes back there's all sorts of questions i would have what did you gain by having these two in there you know like is there were you getting these people to give you money or like uh, winning more people to your Islam. And then later on, when you have power, you say, ha ha, nah, 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 nah. God said no. Uh, and you're stuck here now. You can't leave. Uh, you know what I mean? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I'm just saying makes me have just raises question marks. You, you cannot just ignore the question marks. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You rock. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we have one more. Mr. Morpheus is back. Hadith says Jibril didn't come to his house because of statues, idols at his house. I am not familiar with that particular Hadith, but I'll try to find the one that I just mentioned. Um, okay. Help me out. Give me more context, Mr. Morpheus. I, I'm on the chat side now, so I can see. Is there somewhere specific, like a certain specific hadith you can give or just trying to get the context here yeah sarah says uh, satanic verses are part of the old islamic narrative it was extensively talked about in the first decades of islam it's a touchy subject now because muslims don't read their books well i know some critical scholars who think some think that it's more of like a developed theological thing over time and it didn't have actual historical pedigree to the very beginning even though it was early and then there are some who say actually this might be a memory because it's in like all of these early sources when they talk about it so they they feel like they have to speak about it because it's a thing so i don't know what the answer is i don't know i don't pretend to know 
Still looking for Mr. Morpheus here. If you, oh, hold on, is he? No, he hasn't put anything yet. Did you find anything yet? I found. Yeah, I found the one that I was talking about. Uh, so it is uh, in Tafsir Ibn Kathir, one of the very uh, major uh, tafsirs or interpretations of the Quran. There is this um, story of Al Gharaniq. I'm not sure if anyone. Uh, knew that and basically it says that the prophet was um, reading this verse uh, 52 and when he came to the word anajma he then said haven't you seen alata wal uzza we talked about alata wal uzza earlier in uh, in one of the comments as two of the major uh, gods and whether there is a let um, similar to allah uh, then uh, the, the, the Satan put uh, some words on, on his uh, tongue, his here as, as the prophet started saying uh, or reciting verses actually from the devil, not from God, saying, Al-Gharaniq were actually idols uh, in, in, uh, in Arabia. And he goes, they are actually uh, revered gods and you can ask them for things and uh, whatever they ask for will be granted. Hmm. So now um, you can see that the, the prophet actually praising uh, idols. And eventually, if, if you continue reading Ibn Kathir, he, he will say that uh, uh, God came and removed these parts and said, oh, no, 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 no. These are from the devil. These are not from Gabriel. Um, it's, it's a very interesting story. But weak or not i'm actually telling the story from tafsir ibn kathir this is one of the very major interpretations of the quran so it's not i'm making things up right at the end of the day even if you refute this story it's in your uh traditional That's, books that is a problem i mean imagine <laughs> if all the early church fathers said something about jesus yes and it doesn't look good whether or not it's historical or not the earliest Christians who represent your brand are not doing you a favor. That's the analogy I would paint. And Pretty so much, yes. I personally find that's an interesting question. I also find that interesting historically, but then I also, I'm not always just interested in polemics. I'm curious to know really like, I want to know if we're looking at Joseph Smith, because we actually have better evidence of his life and things he did how he kind of manipulated things, how he did things to empower for women. Anyone who studies Joseph Smith knows what I'm talking about. If you're not a Mormon apologist, you'll know what I'm talking about. This guy came up with so many clever ways to try and get with women. And he literally even came up with an entire today. It's Doctrine and Covenants 132. Like he has an entire in there about polygamy. And it's this, Really, what the prophet says you need to do, or you will be cast into it, eternal torment and outer darkness and all this. And it's what you find out real quick is in this doctrine, he wrote it. The history behind it, I actually had a, a Mormon descendant who left Mormonism. His dad was um, the scribe, or grand, his great great grandfather was the scribe of Joseph Smith. Wow. Um, what's the name of his scribe? I can't even think of the guy's name right now, but that day, Joseph Smith, his brother, Hiram Smith, and the guy, his scribe, came together on how are we going to sell polygamy to Emma? How do we get her in? How do we figure out how to get her in? And that day, Joseph Smith had a revelation. And they wrote this long revelation. And in this revelation, which is still in their doctrines and covenants, it's part of their scripture today. He addresses Emma. Emma, listen to your husband, thus saith the Lord. He has told you what Abraham, the like, and he's using the Bible to try and like get Emma to be on board with having him have many wives because Emma had a conversation with him and his scribe pretty much documents a lot of the history of what was going on around that time. He had an argument with Emma when he tried to get her to agree that he could have many wives because he's the prophet and God said so. She goes, well, if you have many wives, I'm going to have many husbands. He was so pissed off and angry that she said this, that this revelation comes in and in it, God's condemning Emma saying, if you have many husbands, I will do it. Like 
threatening her. So Mm -hmm. I personally find that interesting. And I always ask that question, like, if this is historical, it's hard because it's so far back. We don't have good evidence. But if this is historical, what was Muhammad doing as a humanist, as a person who's not a supernaturalist? I'm like, he's up to something. I want to know the answer. That's how I'm looking at it. You know that this story that you just said about Joseph Smith is uh, there is almost a copy and paste with with Muhammad's. Um, <clears throat> so th- th- there um, there was this woman he wanted to marry, but she was the uh, his his daughter in law because she was married to his adopted son Zaid, and then God immediately well he he got a revelation uh, saying that one. Um, uh you can you can have her as a as a wife that there is there is no problem and two uh this is an actual verse in the quran so people wouldn't dare to blame you for what god has ordained so if if god gives you something uh basically people shut up you don't mm. blame the prophet for what god has ordained to him to the level that in in the hadith then one of the prophet's wives said um something along the line that ah oh, it it is so strange how every time you have a desire god sends you a revelation to grant this desire that is hadith, where, where hadith is that? true hadith by one of the 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 prophets wives. hold on man are you serious? <laughs> i'm serious and it's a it's it's not one of the disputed hadith uh, i i can i can find the i can find the source for you it will take me like five minutes or something, but you can then put it in the description box under the video if you want. That's interesting. I mean, you know what I'm thinking. Like, <laughs> that's pretty persuasive sounding to me that he's getting what he wants by his power. He has power in being the prophet, being the leader of the, the group. And this is exactly what Joseph Smith did. And in fact, the threat was, if you don't obey the prophet, which was um, uh, Joseph Smith and Mormonism, if you don't obey, you will be condemned because you're disobeying God. God is the one speaking through him, and you're disobeying God. And she, he was trying to get her on board. And uh, that scribe said that he delivered that message to her later on after they wrote it. She she just crumbled it up or threw it away. She's like, I don't give a sh- what you say. She just didn't believe him at all. Like, uh, <laughs> But that's interesting. It's funny how you can parallel some of the same behaviors humans have. And and it's a heuristic approach. There's no way to prove, like, absolutely. But I I wish I could do this with early Christianity better. Because there's some scholars who who do look at things like the Apostle Paul. And they try to say, you know, there's some weird stuff that happens in Paul's letters. And in, like, Philemon— there's this freed slave who's trying to run away. Some scholars have done work on it that it looks like he's being sexually abused. And this is a runaway slave. Is one of the Christian people sexually abusing their slave? Like, is Paul involved in this? There's, And these are academics who like know the Greek or are looking at this stuff. There's also a very weird passage in the book of Revelation. I think it's chapter four, where it talks about Christ. And this is Bart Ehrman. He's very, very cautious about saying things that he doesn't feel confident (laughs) about. And it it says that Christ laid her on her sick bed and pretty much rapes her. Now, it's a very, I'll have to pull this verse up. This is like, well, actually, you know what? (laughs) It is getting very controversial here. (laughs) So controversial. I mean, this is the point I'm making. Like, I'm looking for things that people aren't going to tell you at church. Okay. Obviously <laughs> it's, it's super controversial. Let me find this Bart Ehrman. I'm just going to let you, I'm going to play try, the beginning. Try to find it. I it, it, honestly, and on, on the other side, if you read about from a psychological uh, point of view, if you read about the, the Messiah syndrome, um, even though it's, it's not in the psychological manual, but it, it, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, a, a ton of research uh, made on that. If you read about this um, Messiah syndrome and its characteristics and behaviors, you will find a lot of parallels between uh, people like Jesus, Muhammad, even Joseph Smith. Mm. That this 
it's it's ama amazing how how you can see certain behaviors replicating um, among these people. You're not joking. It seems like humans are human. Uh, <laughs> let me share this. Even if they're son of God, <laughs> this is going to be, this is not my words. You heard it from the man. So don't blame me when you hear it. Uh, starting this back at the beginning, I made it quite a controversial intro, of course, but this is what he says later in the interview. And here we go. Uh, let me mute my mic so you don't get an echo. And Christ says, in Revelation chapter 2, that I will take... And Christ says, Revelation chapter 2, that I will take Jezebel and I will throw her on a bed. Okay, so now some translations say hospital bed or sick bed. No, the word is bed and she doesn't get sick <laughs> as in a hospital. Men come and have sex with her. Christ has thrown her in a bed. Men come and have sex with her. We're not told if they are raping her or if she's willing to have sex with them. But um, Christ says he's going to plague these men and he's going to kill her babies. Christ is going to kill her babies. This is Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. <laughs> I want people to let that sink in for a second. You heard it from him, man. Don't blame me. But that, yeah. So, so my wording came across a little bit. But Jesus said he was going to kill her children. But like, it's super, super. But look, anyone who reads Revelation, if you go and read that book, you will see how warlike, how really how rough the language is. The horror of Babylon. Listen to the language. Like, you're calling people whores. It's obviously a symbol for Rome. Uh, don't prostitute. You know, you cannot buy or sell this idea of don't cooperate with Rome. Rome is the whore of Babylon. So it's just really derogatory sexual language used. And it, it's, it gets really nasty. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it, all of a sudden you find all that love and compassionate language that you, you find all over the the gospels turns upside down in the book of revelation and it becomes very nasty. Yeah. There's, there's hints of it in the gospels. It's not as vivid though. Yeah. As revelation. yeah. There's hints of it, outer darkness, uh, gnashing of teeth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And then there is like the, the wheat and the shaft. There's symbolism of saying like destruction's coming, baby. Yeah. And, but but yeah. not in the terms of horror and, uh, it's got bloodshed. It's like a bloodthirsty God. Yeah, in it's, it's, it's a different it's, depiction. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. Um, there is a scene where Jesus calls a woman a dog, um, mm. a, a Phoenician woman, I believe it was, but a Syrophoenician uh, woman calls her yeah. a dog. Yeah, he, he says, well, the, the, the food of, uh, the, the bread of, uh, the sons of Israel cannot be thrown to the dogs. Right. Uh, so, yeah. But even the dogs get the crumbs, Lord, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's like, oh, well, okay. As long as you know, you're a dog. No, I'm just, <laughs> that's like literally <laughs> how the context seems to be. Okay. We have super chats here. A couple more. And then I'm going to let you go. Cause you probably are ready to go anyway. It's two hours. Uh, yes. Mr. Morpheus, <laughs> I cannot read this name. I'm going to. Sunan, Sunan Abi Dawood, uh, clothing kitab al libas. Uh, so Sunan Abi Dawood is a, a very authoritative book in, in Islam, and he's uh, mentioning a particular section of the book, which is about how people should be clothed, the clothing section. Hadith 4158. I wish you copied the hadith um, in, in, in the, in the on, comment. Another one here. I don't know if this is related. Uh, he's talking about oh, okay. So if you can copy that um, link, uh, Derek, and, and and I'm gonna try and see if I can see. copy that. Uh, oh my gosh! Hold on, copy. I'm at the type <laughs> it out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do this. But it's um it's interesting while you're looking this up because uh, Mr. Morpheus in the previous one he said in Sunan Abi Dawood, but then I look at the 
at the link that is provided here, and it is from Al Bukhari. Uh, unless Al Bukhari is quoting, uh, okay. quoting Abu Dawood. I am sharing this here. Let's see here what go. we've got. All right, zoom in. I this is what came up. Uh, let's get a bit of seer. حدثنا زكريا رضي الله عنه وهبنا انفسهم قالت كنت اقرا على التي وهبنا انفسهن لرسول الله قال اتهب المراه نفسها فلما انزل الله تعالى او واو ترجع انت شايف منه فلما راى ربك الا يسار في هواك this is thank you so much mr morpheus <laughs> this is the hadith that i was talking about earlier um uh, Derek and and Mr. Morpheus actually provided the the source here, which okay. is basically about the prophet's wife uh, when she told him, uh, basically, oh my God, I I see God always um, rushes. L literally, it says God rushes in fulfilling your desires by sending you revelations whenever you need one. Uh, so so that was the actual uh, hadith, and it's from. Sahih al-Bukhari, which means it, it is not one of the disputed hadith. It's actually one of the top hadith uh, that you cannot, yeah, you cannot wow. refute. Yeah, and you can see at the very bottom uh, left part of the English, I said to the Prophet, I feel that your Lord hastens in fulfilling your wishes and desires. That's what literally his wife said. Hmm. Uh, and the reason she, she said that, uh, if you read the second line, I used to say, can a lady give herself to a man, but Allah revealed such and such, and she's like, wow, yeah, God always. <laughs> now, gives my you question is, and, and you can read the actual Arabic here, but like, it's hard to read the tone of this. Is the tone hmm. coming from her cooperative? You know, it's hard to know. Is the the tone is like, shaking head. Huh? The tone is like, the, the tone she literally is shaking her head she's like, like i can't believe this like seriously god i can't believe that god really rushes to give you what you want every time and it's no. kind of it's not angry but but it's also like this <laughs> i gotta ask you man what do you why do you think <laughs> this is so interesting why would people write about this like don't they see how this would look bad or is this just like are we outside of the context like at that time this didn't bother anybody like this is like okay yeah so what she she can think what she want and it doesn't bother anybody because they don't care i mean what would they had to write these because some of the verses so in 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 a lot of hadith you will find a verse from the quran so the, here in in this hadith you will find a verse between two brackets and um, the verse is, is quoted. Um, so it was, for, for early Muslims, they needed the context of some verses, like why, why would God say such and such in the Quran? You need a narrative, you need a context. Why would God say in this verse that the Prophet can have more women? Uh, or it, it, in other verse that says, for, for example, uh, so Prophet Muhammad, gave uh, a specific number of wives a man can have right mm -hmm. and i'm not going to go into the details of how these numbers are interpreted but the consensus is that a man can have four wives except the prophet any woman who would come willingly offering herself to the prophet the prophet can take no marriage nothing if, if she's willing to give herself in bed to the Prophet, the Prophet is not to be blamed. He can take her. And that rule was only for the Prophet, not for the general Muslims. And people would question, well, why, why this particular verse was for the Prophet? Because it doesn't benefit humanity in, in any way. It's, it's, right. it's one command for the Prophet to grant him something. So people needed context. So they had to come up with the hadith and the, the narratives that explains, ah, oh, because at that point, the prophet was talking to his wife about such and such, and his wife said such and such, and this is how you come to find these hadith to provide context for certain verses in the Quran. 
that I can't help but think, again, <laughs> still controversial, but <laughs> yeah, I'm still how they exist around at other examples of <laughs> men who take advantage of that power and how that would be clear over here. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Morphus. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again. <laughs> Chris Wood, keep up the great work, Derek. Adam, thanks for doing this. Sorry if it's been addressed on Myth Vision, but could you address the idea that human gestation is scientifically described in the Quran? Human gestation as in... I believe it's... The, eating, eating humans? I know. I think it was the idea that um, uh, how sperm is, is created or something like that, I think. Help me out, Chris. Uh, you know how they say... Um, I think it's sperm, or it might be the idea of the the, the embryo or creation. Yeah, the you've heard the it. argument, the scientific argument. I'm sure, like this is a scientific miracle that we know how babies are born. Or I can't remember what the the damn well, argument. Well, uh, there are, there are two around this area. There there is the how the zygotes and the embryos are created in the womb, and they claim that it is a scientific miracle in the Quran, which is absolutely not. <clears throat> excuse me and there is another it, it's a completely different section where the the quran talks about how the sperms are created in a, in a male's body and, and basically the quran didn't know anything about the glands at the time so it claims that the the sperms are created between your spine and your gut somewhere there uh are where the sperms are created and again it's it's utterly nonsense and, and and completely wrong but then people twist the meanings of things and claim that it is scientifically miraculous that the quran mentioned this and there is this major artery that comes from the spine and this major artery that comes from the stomach and they both feed the testicles and this how did the quran knew that the sperms come from these arteries like, well, that, that's not what the Quran meant at all. Whether we're talking about the embryo creation or the sperm creation, none of them are scientifically described in the Quran. Zero. It's actually in the way that people twist the Quranic verses and read a lot into the text to make it sound scientifically described in the Quran. But no, it is not. That's the short answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've had people try to make that claim. Mr. Morpheus, the other hadith is about the statues. Uh, in the same page, there were two hadith, I think. Uh, if you scroll up a little bit, Derek. No. And is, is it... So did I miss there's, there's no other. There is no other hadith here. It's, it's basically the top section is the Quranic verse and says in that section explaining this Quranic verse you have the bottom section which reads Muhammad's house so I'm looking for I'm scrolling but Mr. Morpheus earlier was talking about uh, Gabriel uh, or Gabriel uh, Gabriel was <laughs> I'm mixing Arabic with English now <laughs> um, Angel uh, Gabriel when he was coming to the Prophet apparently there is a hadith that uh, Gabriel couldn't visit the Prophet in his home uh, because he had idol uh, statues. This is the hadith I said I'm not familiar with or I cannot remember it. Um, but I cannot say it here in this link unless Mr. Morpheus sent. Um, is it this link. one, 4158? Uh, Sunan Abi Dawood, uh, possibly. So if, if you put Sunan Abi Dawood and hadith 4158, uh, okay. that's a different. Oh gosh. I don't even know. <laughs> Let me just try 4158. Uh, so maybe. Happens. Maybe I will do. No, you have to specify the book. Uh, so let, let me try yeah. to do it uh, here. Goodness gracious. You said it's in the Sunnah? Sunan. Which one? Sunan Abi Dawood. I've got to pull them here. Let me see. Okay. Uh, the, the fourth one on the left, Sunan Abi Dawood, yes. And then you have the clothing section. 4158, right? Somewhere here. Clothing. Kitab uh, al yes. Clothing. Okay. And then we need to find that number, which is. Um, oh, so 4158. Hold on. What's the number? 4158. 4158. 4158. Dang, it's pretty long here. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, so the, where's the number? Where am I looking at? 4, 4038. Um, eight. 
Wow, it's way down here. You know, you could have searched the text. <laughs> Would have been easier. Four, 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 there you go. That's four uh, six. No, that's four one four six. Uh, no, no, but this is this is the one. Hang, hang on. This you got it. First one. If you scroll down a little bit, it's the the one. Yes, this one. This is it. أتاني جبريل يس أتاني جبريل عليه السلام فأنا تاني البارحة فلم يمنعني أنا كنت دخلت إلا تمثيل وكان في البيت كل كلب فمر برأس التمثال الذي في قطعة فأسير تهيئة الشجرة Wow I've I have never read that particular hadith before but it's you can you can read the English translation of it and it's wow So Morphe said they sent two hadith um Yes, so, so he sent two hadith. One was about uh, Aisha, the, the, the prophet's wife, uh, saying that he rushes to uh, fulfill your desires. And now this is the different hadith, a second okay. hadith, which talks about how uh, Angel uh, Gabriel couldn't <laughs> couldn't go into the prophet's house because he had uh, statues uh, around the house. And, um, and there's something about a dog I'm trying to read the English now. The dog belongs to El Hassan. Christian spread other people may drink. Order the dog to be turned out. Um, very turned very out. Very interesting hadith. Um, so then that ties with when when he was asking earlier, uh, Mr. Morpheus, about was was Prophet Muhammad uh, worshiping idols. And I said, well, it depends if you're talking about before his 40s or after his 40s, after before the revelation of the Quran or after the revelation of the Quran. So now he's providing this hadith to show that, well, actually, it's, it is after the revelation of the Quran because it's in the time that Angel uh, Gabriel was coming with the revelations, yet the Prophet still had statues in the house and underline statues here because statues are idols and, and Gabriel didn't feel comfortable coming in with these statues and and a dog <laughs> on the side right. um but yeah th th there seemed to be some evidence that the prophet wasn't really fully monotheistic <laughs> or at least assumed in this yeah so why, why would the prophet have uh statues in his, when when he was obviously against all statues and idols hmm interesting um great one mr morpheus again mr morpheus it, strikes again <laughs> <laughs> mr morpheus is doing a lot here tonight and thank you for all that love and support everybody let me go ahead and give a final shout out here to you adam all the hard work you're doing i hope people go and show your english channel some love putting this in the chat it is in the description if you're watching um, putting this in the chat so you can go subscribe. I hope you check out his work and listen to some of the arguments that he brings up. Do you have anything um, to look forward to that uh, people can, you know, uh, be ready to wait for or that you're about to do? Is there anything on the uh, radar? Uh, nothing specific at the moment, but I'm I'm trying to create something new on the channel. So, so most of the videos on the channel at the moment are me talking or or discussing an argument or presenting an argument mm -hmm. what i want to do in the near future is have call-ins where muslims would like the the comment that came earlier this guy is a liar and i would like to have a chat with him and prove him wrong but with no audience <laughs> so what i'm trying to do on my channel very uh in the very near future i'll try to make uh videos where people can call in and Basically, if they want to agree or disagree or expose uh, something that they think I overlooked or they want to show me how or where I lied, it will be interesting to to have some sort of an interaction. Uh, and yeah, I, I would like to have Muslims have their say and me responding why I disagree with with their point of view. This is something I'm, I'm working on at the moment. I really appreciate you giving me your time. Uh, we've been trying to make this work out and we figured out how <laughs> it works. You're working, I'm working. Um, yeah, I'd love to do a documentary at some point going into some material with you and, and diving into the Islamic world. So stay tuned, subscribe. Any final words from you? Maybe some words of encouragement to people out there. 
Uh, one, thank you so much for having me, and thanks for the beautiful audience that attended, that, and those who will watch this after it, it, it is a recorded uh, video. Um, I really appreciate the love, and um, please subscribe to my channel. And yeah, I can't wait to work with you on that documentary together. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody who's watched and shown love, even the criticisms. We appreciate the conversation and allowing that dialogue to take place. Um, I hope you subscribe to his channel. Let him know when you get over there and you comment. Hey, Myth Vision sent me, okay? <laughs> Myth Vision sent me. Let him know so he can feel like, all right, this interview I did over there was <laughs> worth it. Uh, yes, please. And I will try to respond to these comments if I spot them. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Love everybody. Uh, stay positive, stay critical, and never forget, we are Myth Vision. Love y'all. Son, do you want to know what the truth is? After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill and you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to. You take the red pill and you stay in Wonderland. And I show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more.